because of the overlap of the symptoms, because yeah. so much of it is like, and I think that's often why women don't join the dots um, early enough, is they're thinking, oh, maybe I'm just overworked, maybe I'm a bit tired, I have too much on, or I'm just not sleeping well, I have too much on my mind. But I think it's it's sometimes very hard to separate what is my hormones and what is my life. Hi, I'm Joe Clark, and thanks so much for joining me today. This is the Redefining Midlife Podcast, a podcast designed for the 40 plus woman who is determined to challenge society's myths and beliefs around midlife. It's for the woman who is inspired and ready to define midlife her way. Join me each week as I chat to health and wellness experts for up-to-date information on how to live well, as well as some special conversations with incredible everyday women redefining what midlife can look like. Here's to making our next half of life even better than the first. Thanks so much for joining me today and welcome to episode 86 of the podcast. Today, my special guest is Dr. Neve Leonard. Neve is a women's health GP and she's a menopause specialist. She's treated hundreds of women from Western Australia and all over Australia, both face-to-face and through telehealth. And she finds working with women in midlife truly rewarding. As many of my friends, clients and listeners and Instagram followers have found, finding a GP with these particular interest areas and expertise is very rare. Neve also has a master's in sports and exercise medicine and loves sharing her wisdom about the importance of exercise and nutrition during the menopause transition for maximizing your quality of life, not just the length of your life. And when she's not seeing women individually as patients, she loves educating women in perimenopause and menopause through her social media channels about all things hormone and midlife health. You can find those links in the show notes. And Neve passionately believes that if women have good information, they will make the right decisions for themselves and for their future health. So whether you're going through perimenopause or you're postmenopause, The reality is our health needs change because we as women will experience new and different symptoms as we age. And later in the show, I also asked Neve some of the questions that my Instagram community wanted answers to. But before we start today's conversation, I just wanted to let you know about the free online workshops that I'll be hosting at the end of May. Because let's face it, we hear this incredible health advice from the experts, so most of us know what we should be doing but the reality is it can be hard to know where to start. Life is busy and we run out of time or energy to get started. Perhaps we get going and then have trouble keeping it all going and continuing. I get it. In the workshops, I'll be sharing the simple steps and framework so you can create your own wellness plan to suit your life and your health needs. It's exactly what I help the women in my Better Than Before membership to do and the people who attend my paid workshops to do. I'm going to be sharing more details during the month of May on how you can sign up for one of these free workshops. And just to plant a seed, I'd also encourage you to have a friend join you so that you can support each other through the workshop. Now, without further ado, let's welcome Neve to the show. A very big welcome to the Redefining Midlife podcast, Dr. Neve. Hi, I'm very excited to be here. And as I mentioned in the intro, you are a very rare GP. You're a woman's based health GP and a menopause specialist. And as too many of us have discovered, finding and accessing a GP who has your skill set is unfortunately rare. So your time today with us is going to be invaluable. So I really appreciate you being here to talk to us. Oh, thank you. Thanks for that, Joe. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, I mean, I, I I won't speak too much, but yeah, unfortunately, um, me- menopause training is not something that's really standard as part of GP education. We just don't have enough time. So it's really based whether a GP has got a special interest in menopause, whether they will pursue further education and keep up to date, which is difficult because things are always changing. And there has been a lot of change in the last, I suppose, 10, 15 years. Yes. Well, you would have seen that that sort of change quite rapidly, I suppose. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and with the advent of social media, even faster than perhaps before. Yes, yes. absolutely. But hopefully things are on the up. Um, I had an education meeting uh, last night with a group of birth based GPs, all with a special interest in menopause. So it's just nice to see uh, things are changing and there is definitely more interest and hopefully that will result in more female get, females getting the, the care that they need and the up-to-date um, information. That's brilliant to hear, actually, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, no, and perhaps because more patients are demanding or not Mm -hmm. even 
Mm -hmm. Demand is probably too strong a word, but but coming in and and having the expectation that the doctor that they see is going to know what they're talking about to be able to help them, which isn't, uh, you know, too too much to ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, Neve, you're based in Western Australia, but as we can hear, you do have an Irish accent. (laughs) Just a little backstory. When did you come to Australia and what actually brought you here? Um, I've been here for 10 years or 10 and a half years almost. Um, Once upon a time, as a newly qualified doctor, I went over to Sydney just for a bit of fun. I was doing a lot of uh, Irish trained doctors just to get a bit of sunshine and a bit of um, just a change of scene after the many years of medical school. Anyway, after that time, I went back to Ireland, got into GP training, but I thought there was always just something inside me that went, oh, I wouldn't mind going back and having another little stint. Um, when came back in 2014 with two kids with the view to, with, I suppose, just being a short term, you know, few years while the kids were small. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I suppose 10 years later and another, another two kids, uh, <laughs> Yeah, we we are we are definitely still here. It doesn't like we look like we're going anywhere. Um, yeah, as is as is Australia. You know, it's just um, a very nice place to be based. Yeah, well, it's it's Ireland's loss and our gain then. Yeah. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> so obviously, you're a very busy woman with four children, a GP practice, um, special yeah. interest in the area of menopause. So that would be extra training for yes. you. And, and yeah. as you said, that you had a meeting last night, so on a Sunday night to talk to other GPs. So that- yes, like- yes. Yeah. So there was a very rough and ready dinner when I got home at about half six o'clock. It's just, yes, yeah. yeah. So, um, Neve, yeah. have you always had an interest in uh, women's health and menopause? Oh, well, I suppose it's sort of evolved. Like, I suppose when I was a new, newly qualified GP in my early 20s, I was probably very much into women's health and more of the gynae and the, you know, the pregnancy and that sort of stuff. But certainly it becomes very obvious, obvious as, as you, as you, when you're a GP that where your, where your deficits are. And I suppose as my patient population got older and I got older, uh, realized this was something I definitely needed to upskill in. And very quickly, once I upskilled, did really feel that such a rewarding area because it's so neglected um and there's so much misinformation so you know it's just become something that's so much part of my life you know you know social media um so this channel i you know pod, like love this podcast reading going to the conferences it's just something that i really like and it is lovely to have a special interest in gp because it is so general and it's nice to just to have a little bit of extra expertise in an area and I just really enjoy it and I, and I love working with women. Yeah. And does anyone else in your practice have the same interests as you or are you, you sort of been deemed the uh, the menopause specialist or women's health specialist in your practice? Yeah, I, mean, I suppose everyone has their, has their special interests. I'm probably the, mo- the most the most into it you know we do we do talk about it a bit but I did do I did I worked with wealth and the telehealth and um, menopause service so I suppose I did a little bit quite a bit of time with with more dedicated menopause doctors and obviously there's a lot of peer learning there as well so I suppose the more exposure you have you just become a lot more confident mm-hmm. and hence and then you know as word of, word of mouth spreads I just have a huge volume of menopausal patients much to the disgust of my regular uh, GP patients who can't seem to get an appointment with me but I'm <laughs> trying to strike a balance because I do still love my, my general practice so anyhow yeah. It's not enough hours in the day or not enough appointments in the week, but that is yes, yes. No, it'd be it'd be really. I, I just know there's a couple within my um on, on the Sunshine Coast where I'm based. How there are some GPs who women they hear. All right, mm-hmm. this person is a specialist in this area, yeah. and so they get very very busy yes. very quickly. Yes. And because a lot of time has to be spent learning a woman's history and to be able to give mm-hmm. various treatment options for that for that woman, it can take some time, which I can understand it yes. would take away from yes. your your other patients. Well, I, I've had to modify my diary because you know essentially a, a menopause consult cannot be done in a standard fifteen or twenty minute appointment. So I do forty five minute consults for. A new patient, a new new appointment, just so I have that time. Because what was happening was, I have so much to say and so much to talk about, and then it meant I was running super late, and it was just yeah. So things feel a little bit more under control at the moment, but I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh well, let's hope there's going to be more like more GPs like you that need to to take mm-hmm. on the, um, the bulk of what you yes. you're doing. 
So now providing women with good and reliable evidence-based information is something I promote here on the podcast mm-hmm. by having experts such as yourself come in. I also do that in my, my own wellness membership for women and workshops and when I privately work with clients. But right now there is just so much information circulating about menopause and with that also comes misinformation. Mm-hmm. It's confusing for women and it must be frustrating for someone like yourself to Mm -hmm. be up against all of that all the time. So how do you talk to your patients about this and what advice can you give to women who are listening today? Well, I would say, well, certainly in Australia, we have the Australasian uh, AMS Society and we have, there is fantastic resources on that website. I think it might maybe not the easiest to find sometimes, but but that those those information sheets for, for patients for women have been so thoroughly studied and make sure that that they are proper up to date evidence and they are credible resources. They um that's that's a fantastic resource number one. I think any anywhere you hear information through social media, you just have to be careful because even there's subtleties between what. Uh, um, Australian trained doctors and menopause specialists will do compared to the UK and compared to the US and things are just a little bit different so I think that's where there needs to be caution and then there there are will be some some social media influencers who will kind of go, go out of their sort of area of expertise maybe don't have medical training who will be offering advice about HRT and 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 whatnot um, and that's where it just gets a little bit muddy and you always just have to ask those questions. Okay, what what is this person gaining something from this information or trying to sell me something or um and just just I suppose always just having that little bit of caution and don't take anything that you see so on social media as being you know face value really um unless it's backed up. Mm. Um, so yeah, I always would I always direct women to the AMS uh, page or even Jean Hales for women is very good as well. Um and yeah, that's 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 usually what I would I would suggest. Yeah. They're the two that I always recommend yeah. as well. So I'll put the links in the show notes for the, the if anyone wants to head straight there as well that they can just click on and find those. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as you said, yeah, the AMS is is a um, a little trickier to find the information sheets, but if you just go, yes, yes. Gene House is sort of probably more user friendly, yes. but yes. Um, yeah, but you can. Definitely- it's all there. It's all there, yes. and it's yes. yeah, it's just it's just trawling through it a bit, but it is there. Now, prioritizing our health and our wellness is really important for women at this stage of life. And we've got the opportunity to both maximise our length and our quality of life. And I had a recent episode with uh, Dr. Karen Coates on this very topic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've also got a master's in sports and exercise medicine. Mm -hmm. What are the key points about these areas of expertise that you've had that you'd like to share with the listeners? Oh, I just think, you know, exercise is just so undervalued. And I think a lot of women, if they're not that way inclined, would tend to groan about it and go, oh, you know, but really the, the benefits you know if there was a pill that did as much as exercise can do everyone would be taking it you know there's so much evidence in terms of its its ability to reduce dementia reduce your risk of cancers and um, it's mood boosting and, and re- reduce anxiety can help with sleep and really from a from a health span and longevity point of view exercise is just crucial and Trying to hold on to your muscle mass and train to maintain some level of physical fitness. That's going to be the difference to whether you have good quality, enjoyable life in, you know, as, as you go through the decades and whether you end up in a nursing home care or not. And I just think you need to be thinking about that in, in midlife, not waiting till you're a lot older. And, and I see it in, in, you know, older women around me and, and my own mother just how important staying physically fit is. I mean, unfortunately, not everyone can do that, um, you know, due to certain circumstances. But I think when you have the control to make those those decisions while you're still very able-bodied in midlife, that's when you should be doing it. And there's so much choice when it comes to exercise. So even if there's things you just hate, there has to be something, you know, put it to music, you'll find something. And and if your why is that you're going to, it's you know, is is more for not so much about what you look like, but just thinking about all those benefits. Mm. Think of it as something you just have to do as part of your routine. And you never regret exercising, you know, so it's, um, 
I, I do just really think this is trying to get women and, and the gains for the women who do absolutely nothing, the benefit that they can get from just doing a little bit is, is, is massive, even just getting, getting out and doing a bit of walking. Yeah. Uh, but it's a real mind over matter sometimes, just getting into that routine. Yes. And it's just basic movement within your day as well. So just mm-hmm. same as, as functional movement, functional movement. Yeah. To enable you as you get older, because you know, for most women, they get to a certain age and there might be a groan as they get up out of the chair or finding mm-hmm. getting up off the floor a little bit more difficult. But if you start doing some small things yes. daily, regularly, it will will um, improve. Because your independence, like once you lose your independence, does the effect that will have on your mental health as you get older, just thinking about you want to be able to still hang up the washing, bring in the bring in the groceries, all that sort of basic stuff you take for granted. But if you're not actively trying to maintain maintain your strength and your fitness, that that they are sadly things, functions that you will, that once at some stage will not be able to do. Yeah. And what about with regards to uh, nutrition? Is there anything in particular that you advise your your patients? Yeah, well, I think... It's it's tricky because, you know, exercise is kind of easy and not easy in a sense of, oh, you know, half an hour here, an hour there. I think just tuning into what you're eating and why you're eating and, and tr- rather than thinking about restricting, think about all the foods, same way with exercise, what these kind of foods are going to do for you. So we know that probably a lot of, a lot of women, a lot of people in general don't eat enough fiber. So saying, trying to focus on getting at least 30 grams a day. Protein is another huge one that I do talk a lot a lot about, but that's something that I think as busy women we're used to just, you know, a, a piece of toast, a cracker, a piece of fruit, just something quick. And and generally our protein targets are way, are way off. And I think that's something that takes a little bit of time to to change your thinking about that actually you need to be eating a good a good solid breakfast with at least 30 grams of protein um, and over the course of the day aiming for probably at least you know, depending on your body size, somewhere between 90, 120 grams. But that takes a little bit more time. You know, if you're used to just, as I said, grabbing something quickly on the go, you're not going to be thinking, oh, I don't have 10 minutes to make some eggs or or whatever it may be. But it makes a big difference. You actually feel better. And also, as, I, as, I, as I've mentioned, when you're trying to live live longer and healthier, you're trying to hold on to muscle mass and Protein is just so important for that process. So we will be losing losing muscle mass unless we're actively trying to hold on to it. And nutrition is very important as part as part of that. Um, so you know, eating the rainbow, 30 grams of fiber, trying to get enough protein in. And then so I'm focusing on what you want to be trying to do. And I say to women, if you're doing all that, you probably will be so full you won't have time to be <laughs> having all like snacking on all the things because you'll you'll find your blood sugar is quite stable. You're not constantly craving something. So if you're eating properly, you're not gonna be kind of looking for all those other ultra processed foods that you that aren't probably serving you very well. And That's you know, I true. do have yeah. And I, and, and, I, and I have a bit of it, you know, you can't be perfect all the time, but just, you know, trying to have a sort of an 80, 20 rule where you're, if you can, if you can focus on having good meals, you probably find you're not, you're not going to then be having a couple of bags of chips and a block of chocolate every night because you've eaten really well during the day. Um, but it's little things. It's little mm. things. I generally find that the women who maybe don't eat very much, don't have time to eat very much during the day, then they can kind of all unravel in the evening time because they think, oh, I haven't really, haven't really eaten much. And, um, but focusing on what's good for you rather than what you can't have is what yeah. my what kind of motto is. Yep, yep. So now, Neve, you've treated hundreds of women over the years, either face-to-face or through telehealth. Mm-hmm. If we just look at the menopause transition, what are some of the most common symptoms that women come to you for? Mm. Well, that's interesting because obviously there's the women that, you know, particularly if they're GP patients that maybe have, haven't quite joined the dots yet. But I would say it's the not feeling, I say universally, so I suppose not feeling themselves. Mood can be affected quite early and sleep. Um, and then also weight gain. Um, so I suppose I'm seeing more and more women not waiting for the hot flushes, not waiting for the periods to change. And those early symptoms can be just, you know, irritability a bit of brain fog, just not feeling themselves. And it's a feeling, it's a feeling um, where they sort of, I find women are really like, they can be losing their confidence, questioning some of their life choices or where they're at, wondering do they need to give up work. But I would say the effects on the brain are 
up there would probably be most profound or what has the big, biggest impact on a woman and how she's feeling because it affects her relationships as well and her energy levels and then how she functions during during the day. Um, but, you know, as I'm sure you've discussed before, the the, the the symptoms are so wide and varied because we have hormone receptors everywhere in the body. So, um, but probably they'll be the, the main things that a woman will, will present with. And then, it's, then usually when I start to question about other things, like maybe joint pain or muscle pain, um, there'll be a bit of a, oh, yeah, is that is that part of it too? Sorry, I should I should also add low libido is, is nearly universally added in as a symptom. There's very few women that I'd say libido isn't affected in midlife, but that's that's often there as well. Yep. So how do we go about trying to, um, I don't know, educating women, I suppose that's something that they've got to actively do themselves. Mm-hmm. As as a as a body, like a medical body. What's happening in that space to get the information out to women before they mm. they know what's coming up? Maybe yes. maybe social media now and it's being spoken about mm-hmm. more. It's mm-hmm. coming into people's awareness, but it still takes women by surprise. Yeah. And yeah. as you said, it's a matter of joining up the dots because yes. they might look at one isolated symptom and not really mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. associate that with with the transition time. Yeah, well, I suppose it's sort of opportunistic things. That, so I mean. Obviously, I'm a bit biased because everyone I see, I'm start, I'm looking at them through a menopause lens. I'll see someone with a cold at like 39 and start asking them about their periods or, you know, yeah. do you know what's coming kind of thing. Um, but I think, you know, Jean Hales, they do, um, you know, Women's Health Week. They try and, and promote, um, you know, education. I do think social media, Facebook groups, that kind of thing are definitely spreading the awareness. And women definitely know more than generations gone by. and and. I think that's the way that the movement is just going to be. It's just going to be word of mouth. And I think women in the sort of the postnatal period are the women that really should maybe be given the information about what's to come because it's, it's funny, you know, you're, you're told, oh, you know, from 35, it's harder, harder to get pregnant or from 40, you'll never have a baby or whatever. But you still think, you know, I'm going to have periods for another 10 years, but you're never, women are never really told, well, what's going to happen if I'm, I'm still having periods, but I'm not really fertile. What am I? Mm. like what else am I going to feel and like you know things are changing but um I, I do think things are things can only improve I think you know with girl young girls prepared for puberty women speak a lot about pregnancy and I think this is the next thing that women should and hopefully will more and more become informed about but, mm. but women we're different we are definitely seeking more information than the generations gone by and it's there and it's available so yeah and it's also an area that's starting to be researched more because yes. prior, to, prior to the last 15, 20, 20 15, uh, 15 to 20 years, there hasn't been a lot of research yes. in women's health either. Yes, because mm. women are hard to study because we change week on week. So even in a lot of like cardiovascular drugs, a lot of the studies are done in men and, you know, we're not, we are, it's just small men yeah. with different um, body parts. Um so yeah, it is an area that will need a lot of investment for more more studies, etc. But I, I do think the tide is turning a bit. Yeah. So Nave, many women might go to the doctors for the symptoms that you described, and mm-hmm. they might get a very different response to what you would give them. So mm-hmm. is there advice that you would have for these women if they feel that they may not have been heard by their doctor, or have had their symptoms dismissed and mm-hmm. they're just brushed off, or mm-hmm. you know? You know, it's a stage of life. Of course, you're going to feel like that because it's busy. So what could you suggest for them? Yes. So I think probably the best thing you can do before an appointment, if you've, if you're already kind of joining the dots and quite, quite suspicious that this is perimenopause or menopause, I would, I would definitely print off the AMS menopause symptom score. So that basically has a list of the, of, of, of symptoms and you would, you, you write down, you know, the severity of the symptoms, you know, one, two or three. Yep. Um, bring that into the appointment and essentially what you're what you're kind of saying and, and the thing is you're either going to meet a GP who's going to be like oh yeah yeah absolutely yeah let's let's see but you're or, or you're going to meet a GP who goes oh don't be don't be ridiculous or I don't think so or you're too young or but sometimes a GP might be just caught off guard and maybe not that comfortable particularly if you're quite young or you're not you're not what he or she was expecting so Sometimes it may be a case of you bringing in your, your, your sheet. Um, and although like you don't diagnose perimenopause on a blood test, if you don't get the 
response that you need or maybe your GP needs a little bit of time. It may be a matter of, oh, well, what I would often do is let's do some blood tests to see is there anything else that could be going on. And often that's a case of with, with, with menopause and perimenopause that a lot of symptoms overlap with other things. So sometimes it's a, it's a kind of case of ruling out other things. And then it's like, well, what you're left with, left with here is menopause. Um, so things like just checking your thyroid function, maybe your, 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 your iron status, um, et cetera. Blood tests aren't particularly reliable, but you know, they may or may not be done. But so I would say going in with that symptom score, maybe requesting bloods purely just to rule out other things and then saying something along the lines of like i would you know as per ams guidelines i would i would like to try you know some safe form i believe this is safe and as per you know the the body of evidence i'd like to try and the gp might will may or may not say yes or may say oh well, let's check the bloods and come back and either the GP will read up themselves and go, yeah, I think that's a good idea, or else they'll say, I don't think so. Maybe you should try an antidepressant or whatever. But if you have no luck with your own in, with your own GP, even though you've pretty much planted the seed and, and tried your best, um, then if there's not someone else, so there is, on the AMS website there is a list of GPs with a special interest um, or who who are members. So you would expect you would get a better response from one of those. So you can you can search by area. Now, I do appreciate if this is all expensive. You're going to see one GP, then you have to go and see another one. You know, then we have, I know, like Facebook groups often will recommend GPs with a special interest as well who are good in the area. But then there's, then there is a WellFem in Australia who are the telehealth service. So they are dedicated GPs with a special interest in menopause who, who can see women through. So no matter how remote you are, uh, you can see you through video um, telehealth. So. That's another option, but it does get expensive and it does get very frustrating for a woman, particularly when ultimately she's suffering and she just wants a bit of help. Yeah. Um, but it just, it's sometimes I have had, I have a few patients who've been referred to me by a GP who said, Oh, look, I agree that this is what it is. I just don't feel that comfortable myself. So maybe go down to, you know, and suggest to come to see me. So. I think that's a that's a nice reply from a GP who kind of is is appreciating that this is what's going on. But you know, the same way if I saw someone with a skin lesion, I didn't really like the look of. I go look, maybe go and see someone else. They've got the expertise. So I think it's about talking about talking to your your friends and peers about who in the area is 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 up to speed. And um, but you might be surprised by your own GP. Yeah. Um, so sorry, it's a bit long winded. No, it's 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 not a it's not a one size fits all. Yeah. That you yes. can but, but but I would say don't don't take no for an answer or don't not, not that don't like not that it's a bad but just there is I think there is going to be, you've got to find a way so just don't yeah. give up yeah well I think you've got to be an advocate for your own health haven't mm-hmm. you so if that's the case mm-hmm. if you're not happy with what mm-hmm. you hear then yes. then perhaps yeah seek, seek an alternative yes now, I'd like to talk about some of the treatment options that are available for women with menopause symptoms. And mm-hmm. treatment options have improved greatly and they've changed over the last few years. So could you talk about some of the most more common ones that you um, would say through your mm-hmm. clinic or through your mm-hmm. doctor? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I suppose when we think of females and ovaries, I mean, the first thing that springs to mind will be estrogen and we are lucky that we have um, body identical estradiol. So that's the estradiol that is um, as closely related to the estrogen that our ovaries produce. Um, this is con- in comparison to the older form of, of HRT, which was more, I suppose, more um, synthetic estrogen. So estradiol is the main hormone. And usually that's the hormone that's its fluctuating level is, is responsible for a lot of the symptoms, particularly the hot flushes, et cetera. Um, so usually we favor giving estrogen through the skin because it is even safer than a tablet form because it, it doesn't interact with any of the clotting factors in the liver that a tablet would do. So when we say through the skin in Australia, we have gel and a patch. Um, in the UK, they also have spray. Um, so that would be the main one. Then obviously, if you have a 
uterus, you have to also take some progesterone or progestogen because estrogen on its own will stimulate the lining of your uterus and you do you do not want to have a thickened, thickened uh, endometrial lining. So progesterone is, is uh, needed uh, to protect that. But progesterone also has some very positive effects. And when it's broken down, it is very good for sleep and also can be quite calming. Um, and some women just absolutely love that effect of, of progesterone. So that's that's also, it's micronized progesterone. So that is also what we call body identical. So, so very similar to what our ovaries produce after um, an ovulation. Um, and then we have vaginal estrogen, which acts locally within um, the vagina. That is for genital urinary syndrome of menopause. So dry vagina um, um, for effects on the bladder. So urinary frequency um, can also be good um, for women who get recurrent UTIs. Um, and then we have testosterone. So testosterone is one that's usually, often it can be the myth, missing piece in a woman's sort of HRT. And um, so we don't usually, we, we wouldn't generally give it straight away because testosterone will just be converted into estrogen so if you've got very low estrogen um and you you give give, give a woman um to or she takes testosterone it's just going to be converted into estrogen and really it's best to be given or it's, or it's going to have most benefit if you've if she's already sort of estrogenized um but testosterone is you know each each, each woman is unique and uh, while for some women estrogen is is makes the biggest difference there are other women who who there's there's still something missing, and and despite doing everything else, there's just something that doesn't seem to be right. So currently, uh, testosterone is is licensed for use um for reduced libido. It, it is an area that there's just not a lot of evidence, um, and there is studies ongoing. But a lot of women anecdotally will find that maybe they have improved um brain function, just feel sharper, um improved strength and um, that kind of thing but we can't we can't prescribe it for those purposes it's, it's a, sometimes it's a case of women will be will be using it for low libido and then they happen to find that they also have these other benefits but i do believe that that's an area that we're just going to learn more and more about i think testosterone has sort of been wrongly labeled or sort of associated as a male hormone but actually women do need testosterone um but it is amazing to find just the difference that some women will try testosterone and just feel like a different person and others will go, God, that, that, that made no difference whatsoever. Um, so as is the beauty of menopause, every, every woman I meet is going to be different. And it's just trying to find that, get the, get, sort out the puzzle and figure out what exactly she needs. But they would be the common ones that we would go, we would go with. Uh, and we're just lucky that we have choices. Yes. Although. And, and they- do you find that a woman's needs will change throughout the course of her transition years and and post menopause as well? Yes. So a woman's um, symptoms are going to be at their worst in sort of the final few years of the, of her periods, and then the first few years after the cycles have stopped in general. Um, so that's when her needs are going to be highest. And we might have, a woman might be feeling great; she's still having a period. And then she might find that actually my patches are working anymore or that dose of gel, this doesn't seem to be enough. And that's sort of a case of, you know, a woman's been taking a bit of estrogen, but her ovaries have already been give, are also giving her a little bit of estrogen. And then once the ovaries completely mm-hmm. cut out, she may need a little bit more. But then as a woman gets older, her body, like in the background, the body's adjusting and figuring out life without estrogen. So the body's clever. So, because a lot of women will ask, oh, well, if I, if I take this, am I just delaying, delaying the inevitable? But in the background, the body is adjusting. So what will happen then as a woman moves further away from the final period, her needs will become less. And most women then as they get older will need less, will less, will need less estrogen. Right. Um, but it is a constantly kind of changing mm. scenario. And um, I suppose it's just... It's not a case of, oh, I, I see a woman once, I prescribe her something and that's all, that's it, happy days. Unfortunately, there's always going to be ebbs and flows and we just have to try and continue to troubleshoot as things change. Yeah. And all women know their body best, so they'll know when they <laughs> feel, you know, when mm-hmm. something's feeling like mm-hmm. it needs adjusting as well and to be mindful of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, recently, you know, I had a woman who was very stable on her medication and then, symptoms all came back again 
And that was a scenario where, you know, we checked the bloods to see, are you actually absorbing this or what's going on? Because, you know, she started to wonder, was this in her head or, but yeah, her estrogen levels were very low. So, you know, we were wondering, is this a bad batch or is, you know, you know, has something changed on her skin or, you know, it, yeah. we're constantly trying to figure things out. But ultimately the woman knew that something wasn't right. Yes. Um, we were kind of back to trying to figure things out again. Yeah. And that can sometimes be difficult for, for women when they are through that busy phase of life when there's so much going on that they don't actually have time. Mm-hmm. They know something's a bit off, but really to take stock and, and mm-hmm. think mm-hmm. about what's going on in your, in your body. Mm. Because of the overlap of the symptoms, because yeah. so much of it is like, and I think that's often why women don't j- join the dots um, early enough because they're thinking, oh, maybe I'm just overworked. Maybe I'm a bit tired. I have too much on or I'm just not sleeping well. I have too much on my mind. But I think it's it's sometimes very hard to separate what is my hormones and what is my life. And yes, um, but I think the vasomotor symptoms are the ones, and sometimes they're a blessing. So if you have those, at least you could. They're very easy to sort of. They're a really nice marker up because you can say, well, your 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 vasomotor symptoms should be, you know, almost completely settled with your estrogen. So we know if they if they've disappeared, the things must be right. But if they come back again. Yeah, but for women who don't get hot flushes and never get hot flushes, it's always a little bit harder to, to gauge because invariably women have very hectic, busy lives yeah. and have a lot of stress, and they're in that time of their life where they're still possibly looking after kids, and they've got all aging parents and working, and maybe relationship stress, and you know, it's very rare I'll meet a woman who go, "Oh, my life's a, you know, my life's a double," you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, she's a unicorn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, for some women, the the change in their periods and getting the really heavy periods where it can almost feel like it, it's a crime scene. Um, mm. Does does the, the uh, hormone replacement therapy does that mm. help with with those the heavier periods? Yes. Well, women? often often the uh, the really heavy torrential periods uh, can, they can come quite early sometimes, um, as in early in the journey because. You know, as I mentioned earlier, there is that period of, of time where we're no longer as fertile as we once were, but we're still having periods of what's going on. And one of the early changes are is that that you may have a cycle where you don't properly ovulate or you won't have that same rise in progesterone post ovulation. And progesterone is the hormone that tries to keep the lining a bit thinner. And so if a woman's coming to me with a lot of heavy periods you know in my head I'm thinking oh she's 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 maybe hasn't got a lot of progesterone in the second half of her cycle and hence has got a really a really thick thick lining and then as a result a really heavy period or there may be adenomyosis so or or changes that have happened since having children so in in regards to sort of the treatment of of those heavy periods yes HRT can help to regulate it a bit and make it a bit, bit thinner Although I will kind of caveat and say that Prometrium is sometimes not as good as some of the older forms for thinning out the uterine lining or the endometrium. But the, the Marina IUD can be fabulous in that space. Um, it all just depends on whether a woman has a kind of an appetite for it or not, because sometimes they're just like, oh, I'm, I'm done with sort of that kind of thing. Although it's, it, in in the whole HRT prescribing, if a woman has a marina IUD, so she has that intrauterine device in her uterus, she wouldn't require any type of progesterone. So she would just could use her estrogen patch or gel, um, and it can it can for some women um, cause periods to disappear altogether, just become really light. And I would have to say that the, the terrible periods are up there with probably the most debilitating symptoms because. You know, often you can't leave the house, or you can't go to work, or you know, just and it doesn't seem to be a proper pattern. You know, you could be bleeding every second week, and you know, you know, as I mentioned, you know, trying to benefits of exercise, so you can barely get out of mm-hmm. get out out of the house, let alone exercise. So that's something that shouldn't be underestimated. I suppose the impact of those really heavy flooding periods on a woman's on a woman's life, but also then it results in iron deficiency which leads to more tiredness. So I certainly wouldn't be, I I think women should be seeking help for that early. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Now you mentioned the genitourinary symptoms of menopause or GSM. That's something Mm -hmm. that takes many women by surprise because they don't expect those sorts Mm -hmm. of symptoms. 
Mm-hmm. And they're sometimes too embarrassed perhaps mm-hmm. to discuss those symptoms with yeah. their doctor. So can you just go through those again for, for women so they do know that it is common and just how common is it mm-hmm. and then how the, the vaginal estrogen that you mentioned, um, it's topical. So if you're worried yes. about having um, hormone Standard therapy, therapy, yeah, so can you can you go through yes. some of that that for yes. us, ladies? So your the vaginal walls, the vaginal tissues, the vulva, the bladder, they're in um anatomically they're very close to the ovaries and they have loads and loads of estrogen receptors. And they're used to having plentiful estrogen in the whole vicinity of the pelvis. So unfortunately, compared to other areas of the body that will adapt and change to life without estrogen, these cells don't, the the body basically figures that if you're no longer able to reproduce, the vaginal walls are not really of benefit to you as a woman. So what happens is that the vaginal walls lose their elasticity, become less flexible, become drier, and the the skin can become very fragile. So women, for some women, they can find intercourse really painful and find they've got very, um, very little lubrication. For other women, it's not even sexual intercourse. They can even find just, you know, wiping themselves after going to the bathroom can be painful. They feel their skin is just really sensitive, could, can barely sit down or ride a bike. May also find they have issues with their bladder. So, you know, another thing that can disturb sleep will be getting up frequently during the night, but that sort of feeling of always needing to go. So the impact also of low low estrogen in the vaginal tissues is that it changes the the pH of the vagina and the healthy bacteria in the vagina. So you no longer have the same protection against UTIs. So that's why women can can then sometimes get into a cycle of cystitis or UTIs, which, you know, it's just not not fun to add to to everything else. And, And we don't know why there's, I would say at least 50% of women are affected, but definitely it's underreported. And um, there'll be some women who never have any bother, but um, I do suspect that women are just too shy to admit it's an issue. And I think what what some women think that what some, some women maybe think, well, if I'm not sexually active, say if they're single or that it's no longer no longer sexually active, they think, oh, I don't need to worry about it. But that's not the case because, particularly in older women, UTIs can have can be can be really serious women can become septic and end up in hospital and i think um shouldn't be embarrassed by the fact that this is a, like a, an issue with your vagina and um that the treatment is the application of locally of local vaginal estrogen so either in a pessary or in a cream and the beauty of it is it just is is used by the cells locally in that area and <clears throat> doesn't get into the bloodstream. So it's safe to use. You don't have to use progesterone. And it um, is also can be used in women who have a previous history of, say, a, the breast cancer. So oncologists are generally quite happy with that um, um, because it, the, the, the thinking is that if you were to use it for a year, it's the equivalent of taking one one milligram tablet um, in you know, the amount that would actually get oh, into your system. So it's just such a small, small amount. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. So it's very safe and can make a huge difference, but it is something that generally needs to be kind of long-term because, as I mentioned, your, your vagina walls don't adapt the way, say, your brain is going to adapt to the to the changing hormone environment. So, And there's, there is different ways to use it, but it, 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 as I said, it's got benefits um, beyond just sexual function, definitely urinary function and um, pelvic floor, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think in the UK that- this year they, they did, they've made it over, available over the counter. So, Oh, is that uh, right? That may be something that in the future we will see here. Who knows? Yeah. And how, how often would women need to use the cream? Uh, twice a week is the maintenance therapy. Sometimes if symptoms are severe, we'll say we'll recommend using it daily for the first two weeks and then to drop down. But the it, it it's not um sometimes women find on the twice a week that's not enough, so they might need to use every other day. Again, it's just individualizing that and just seeing what works best. I would say in practice, often women find it hard to remember to use it. And that's, you know, that's just a part of it. But um, 
definitely it's beneficial if you can if you can uh, remember to use it yes well it makes sense doesn't it to know that that everywhere your body is going to change if the skin on the mm-hmm. outside if you can see if you can notice changes in your own skin on your face on yeah. your hands on your it's going to be it's going to be uh you know changes down in the 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 um, vulva mm-hmm. and vagina area as well Completely. yeah now, I have grouped some together some similar types of questions that my followers on Instagram sent to me after they knew that I was going to be speaking yes. to you. So I've grouped these here now, and we probably, some of them we have, you have actually answered, but I'll just quickly go yes. through them again just to, to wrap up so, so we can talk about the important things once again. One question that was quite common was, when can you begin hormone therapy and how long can you stay on it? Mm-hmm. So there's no arbitrary rules about this. Uh, I My advice to women is as soon as your symptoms are having an impact on your quality of life or your relationships, that's the time to sort of go and, and seek it. You know, there's nothing to say that once you're on it, you have to stay on it. So you could give it a go. I sometimes have women who, give, who, who may maybe try it for a bit and then come off it and then maybe a few years later come back and go, okay, I think I really need it now. Or um, so... Yes, there's never, it's never, I think some women think, oh, I should wait till I'm really, really bad or wait till my periods have stopped. And that's, that's like, that's, that doesn't make sense. You can, you can start as as soon as you feel that you need to try something. Uh, And sometimes it can, it can be a case of when women try it, then they realize that that they then only realize how bad they really were feeling, but they go, oh, I just feel so much, so much better. And I mean, if you think about it in perimenopause, your ovaries are still producing hormones. So you're just trying to supplement it a little bit to try and sort of steady the ship a bit. So you're not really doing anything that's crazy physiologic. Like you're you're just sort of trying to keep in what in what what is your normal amount, your normal levels of hormones. So um, I think some women think that they shouldn't start in perimenopause, but that's often the case when symptoms can be really bad. So then in terms of how long you can stay on it, again, there used to be rules about, you know, five years or 10 years. And again, the, the, it, it is a matter of just having a, re- a review on an annual basis with your doctor and just weighing up the pros and cons. And um, I mean, we haven't haven't got there yet, but, you know, it's not just symptoms that, be- that, that will benefit from hormones. So we know bone density and cardiovascular health in particular can also and um, will also be better with um, hormone therapy so it is I'll always be looking at a woman's um, bone density and her heart disease uh, risk factors and just weighing it all up and then just sort of seeing making sure she's on the safest type of hormone therapy and and then making that shared decision yes um the another one will my symptoms disappear once I'm finally post-menopause uh, so I suppose it depends which which symptoms. So uh-huh. I would say definitely like for a lot for the for a lot of women the vasomotor symptoms, so the hot flushes and night sweats will eventually go. Although there are some women in the seventies and eighties who still get hot yes. flushes. Oh, I have oh, those poor ladies. Yes. So like the brain fog definitely improves post menopause. You know that that fatigue will improve joint pain the ache of you know it, it it is it is hard to say because obviously sometimes that can then get replaced with osteoarthritis pain but that's severe those severe symptoms are you know just reminding yourself that things are at their worst in that perimenopause and, and early postmenopause and things will get better it's not going to be a scenario where you're suddenly going to feel back to you were 35 again but they will they will for most women disappear another question my libido my libido has all but gone what can help yeah so libido is a complex one particularly if there's sort of a mismatch in libido in in, in the relationship so you know one of the reasons the libido disappears is First of all, we're, when we're not as fertile as we once were, what were Mother Nature sort of things? Well, what's the point? You know, you, you naturally have a spike in, in libido around ovulation when you're at your most fertile. And obviously, when you're you're no longer having that those ovulations, you're not going to get that same natural um, increase. But libido in women is very complicated, and particularly if a woman is stressed or fatigued and she's not feeling well in a lot of other ways, libido is just not 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 going to be there. Um, then 
with with the whole body shape change um sometimes a woman a woman loses her confidence and just does not want any sort of physical touch so it's 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 difficult i think communication is really important and i suppose communicating to your partner about kind of what's going on and i would say some women will find once they can kind of understand what's going on and maybe start some hormone therapy and feel a little bit like there's there's a positive direction they might feel like a little bit of libido comes back but i think the communication is 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 very important and the other thing can be just trying to find other ways of being intimate because sometimes partners also have issues as well and i think an un- an underutilized resource is resource is um you know sex therapists and and some some there are some um books out there as well that can help but for a lot of women they just feel a bit shy and a bit it can be a bit hard to um kind of explore those kind of options um, but don't give up, particularly particularly if it's something that is really important to your relationship, which for a lot of women it is. And I think just talking to your partner about it, because sometimes partners can think that it's it, you know that they're they're being rejected, yeah, um, rather than a woman just having her own her own issues. So yes, unfortunately, there's no magic pill, but I would say sort of optimizing your physical health, your mental health, your your medication if that's the way you're going, talking to the partner, maybe thinking about it. And a sex therapist or a sexologist, um, and as I said, finding other ways of being intimate can help as well. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, there's lots of layers to that that question. Mm-hmm. Just a, mm-hmm. an easy mm-hmm. answer for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, one um, one other lady wrote that she keeps on getting ads all over Instagram about a product. I won't name <laughs> it here. Um, that will help with symptoms. And she asked, "Am I be- best to stick with science and my GP, or could it genuinely help?" <laughs> I think I know what product she's talking about. <laughs> and I think I get those ads too. Um, yeah, I mean, oh, the, the, the problem, and this, you know, I could talk all day about this, but what women in, in, in midlife are sort of definitely being preyed upon. They're very vulnerable because obviously there's a lot going on and they're looking for a solution. And, you know, if they're not getting answers from their GP or they're getting dismissed, they will look for some, if there's, if there's something that sounds like it's amazing on the internet, they'll just buy it. But, in general, those products have very, very little, if any, evidence. And they may contain some herbal remedies that have a little bit of low-grade evidence that may help with mild symptoms. But if something's professing to, you know, get rid of a meno belly or any of these other mm. such things, it's probably too good to be true. Um I mean, they're, pro- they're probably unlikely to cause harm, but at the same time, they just haven't been studied. So I usually would say stick with science. Yeah. I will oh, always- buyer beware. Actually, I yeah. saw a, a couple of um, posts by Dr. Jen Gunter over the Oh, weekend, yes. Where she was talking about that and that, that whole, whole product. Yes. Medicine. So it's not yes. evidence-based. It's, yes. it's out to get, get your yes. dollar, basically. Yes. Um, another question. I'm needing help with weight gain. Is fasting or restrictive eating good for menopause? Mm, that's a very interesting question because a lot of women will find I mean fasting is is massive and a lot of a lot of people do it um but I think this the studies for fasting or the benefits of fasting have largely been done in men and I think when women are going my well my take on it is that when women are going through through perimenopause and menopause their body is all already under stress and I don't think that depriving yourself of food for a prolonged period of time particularly during the day is that is that good an idea it may just increase the stress in your body so my I always advocate for eating and for eating good food I do think it's a good idea to to set a little limit in the evening and say okay I'm not going to eat beyond say 7 p.m or 8 p.m., whatever t- time you can manage, and then giving yourself a sort of a natural fast of maybe 12 to 14 hours, but nothing sort of too dramatic. I, 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 you know, I meet women every day and they're like, I'm not functioning well at work or I've got terrible brain fog and they tell me they're not eating anything until 2 p.m. I'm like, well, oh, how do you, you know, I mean, it's, I, I think you have to listen to your body. For some women, they can find fasting amazing, but I, I just think you have to be sensible. I think eating with your, you know, in, in line with your circadian rhythm, so having a breakfast, a lunch, a lighter dinner, and then putting a limit at the end, trying to avoid too much of the, you know, heavy processed foods and 
you know, too much alcohol, sugar, etc. That's probably going to stand in better stead than 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 fasting. Because I think a lot of it comes down with fasting is that ultimately you're just eating less calories. And I'm always wary that women who fast maybe just don't have the opportunity to eat enough protein. And that's something that, as I said earlier in the conversation, is just so important. So if you're only eating one or two meals a day, how are you going to get that? Yes target so i'm not a huge fan of fasting and perimenopause but some women find it that it, it's it, it helps and i'm not a nutritionist or a dietitian it's just something that i mm. i own feelings about yeah um, but uh, yeah in, in regard to weight gain yeah as i said protein and eating well and trying to do strength-based exercise and um, more so than cardio but listening to your body like if you're not sleeping well got terrible hot flushes you know, your body is not going to be losing weight. It's just going, it's going to be trying to store more fat. Um, so you have to be sort of realistic and patient with yourself. And I think sometimes it's, it's, it's a time of life where you do have to take stock of everything and go, am I, is everything I'm doing just too high intensity? Do I need to just chill a bit, have, do a bit of yoga, go for more for a walk rather than a, a really you know high high energy hit session or whatever so i think that sometimes can be a problem that women think oh they need to be doing loads of cardio to lose weight sometimes that's just causing more of a problem yeah yeah great that's, advice. that's a whole other conversation <laughs> <laughs> all right so that's it for the listener questions we've just yeah. got a few wrap-up questions to finish yes. our episode together now mm-hmm. you've got a philosophy that menopause really is a second spring and it's mm-hmm. time to be embraced. It's a time to be embraced and not feared. And I was so resonate with that. I think that's a great message for women to have. Do you want to talk about that just a little bit more about what what your feelings about this stage of life is? Yes. Well, I think like that women should be seeing as a new sort of stage of freedom. Like in general, if you get to if you're lucky enough to get to fifty, you may find that your kids are less needy. They may no longer even be living there. You hopefully are just more comfortable in your own skin and can think about what you really want to do. You know, I think when we're in our 20s and 30s, it sometimes can feel like you're on a bit of a hamster wheel of I better get a job, I better do this. And I, I, I just feel women get to, a, to an age where they just feel like they just want to suit themselves and they don't really care so much about what other people think. And it can be quite freeing. So they can kind of free themselves mentally and then sometimes they'll have a little bit more time to actually do all those things they've wanted to do if they're feeling well enough. So things like travel or new hobbies or mm. whatever. But I, I, I do find women will often just be more content once they've gotten through it. And I think it is, it's, it's like getting to that, you know, when you're, I always remember, you know, being at school and you think, oh, I just can't wait to be not having to get up every morning and do all, you know, you are your own boss and you can, you know, you've got nobody to to be maybe worrying about anymore. And I just think it's such an opportunity. Mm. You're still very able bodied and you you have I mean our big our big the biggest commodity or the most valuable commodity we have is time and maybe finally now you have time. So if you can be feeling well as well as having a bit of time and a little bit less care factor, you can do what you actually want so enjoy it love it and that's that whole re- why i'm redefining midlife and that's why the yes. podcast exists <laughs> so that message can be heard a positive <laughs> spin on whatever else is going on yes. in life. Um, i'm going to add all of your direct links to the show notes but for women who you know aren't are wanting to find you right now what's your instagram handle because that's your sort of preferred platform mm-hmm. oh yeah um at my menopause doctor that's uh, so all one word obviously um and yeah, I'm on Instagram and Facebook. And try in the process of trying to upload all my videos to YouTube. Just someone put the fear in me about what if your Instagram just suddenly disappears. So I'm just trying <laughs> to find another place to put everything. And uh, Neve, what are you your top three daily wellness habits that are non negotiable for you? Um, number one would be movement of some description and that is you know depending on how your body's feeling just just so it's a habit that even if it's just half an hour a very short stroll or whether if you've got more energy to do some weights or go for a run or do something more higher intensity but just that every day not only do you have the benefit of movement but you also have that time to yourself if you are doing it by yourself so movement would be number one um for me then 
I always like I always try and have a good morning. So I, I feel like my breakfast is is a non-negotiable for me. So probably the last maybe three years or so I've been um trying to hit that 30 grams of protein. And I was always just a you know porridge oats for breakfast, which you know for years as well, that's healthy. Mm. Um but um so I will have uh three eggs I take the yolk out of one egg and so um and some healthy healthy fat so in the form of a um bit of avocado and maybe some wholemeal toast or whole grain toast and tomatoes or whatever I have in the fridge and I just feel like if I'm going to work in particular I may not have a chance to sit down and have anything to, to eat till one or two or whatever's going on but if, if you've eaten well not only is my brain going to function better but I just feel better I'm less likely to go and go and have a chocolate biscuit or whatever so yeah um and then this doesn't always happen but then (laughs) my last one is going to be is going to be sleep and that's difficult when I've got a busy house and all sorts of random things (laughs) happening but I do try and get myself to bed but that's probably my weakest link for sure and currently my sleep my sleep is pretty good um but I just know that that's the, I, I love the I love the evening times. I love when all the kids have gone to bed and there's just a bit of peace and quiet, and maybe the house is a little bit cleaned up. And I feel like ah, oh, just sit in the couch here. But yeah, unfortunately, uh, sleep is is just so important, and that's something that I try and prioritize if I can. But I'm still working on that. We're not we're not perfect. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, it's not not always easy to do, and especially mm-hmm. if you've got you know, like you said, if you've got four children too. <laughs> also, in the mix, it would not be easy. Um, what are you most looking forward to in the future? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, I suppose personally and professionally, I you know, I, I'm I'm lucky to have a a very happy, healthy household in general. Apart from, as I mentioned, about my daughter's ankle, but um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing my kids grow up um, and to do more travel. And I suppose from a work point of view, I, I'm just, yeah, I feel so lucky that I, um, this is the work I get to do. It's such a privilege to meet women every day and to help them. So I suppose more, more of the same of that, I suppose. Oh, that's a, that's a lovely thing to look forward to. And what are you most enjoying about this stage of life? Um, yeah, I think that, that sort of freedom to be your own person and do what suits you. Um, I like, I think, you know, that there's sort of the peer pet pressure is gone. It, that's, that's what I feel. I feel you can just uh, do, do what you want. Um, um, so yeah, I enjoy, I enjoy that. Excellent. And our final question then, Neve, what do you hope 80 year old Neve is going to say about current day Neve? I hope she's going to say, oh, I'm glad she was so proactive about, um, about her health because yeah this is the time where the, the the choices you make are going to make a difference to your eight-year-old self so um you know as you've seen on my socials i'm trying to trying to do more strength-based exercise and um optimize my nutrition etc so i'm hoping that that will that will all stand to me and that when i'm 80 i'll be i'll be um in good physical health and obviously as a result hopefully mental health so that's what i'm hoping Excellent. I'm sure that'll be the case. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time today, Neve, and for oh, being. No, that was great. Right. That was yeah, that I was really fun. enjoyed it. Uh, all right, Joe. Thank you. Right. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks so much for listening and sharing your time with me today. I'd love you to hit subscribe on Apple Podcast or your favorite podcast app to keep spreading these empowering messages. Please share this podcast with other incredible midlife women in your world. Join me again next week for another redefining midlife conversation. Thanks again for tuning in.